to try to think as a Muslim. Most of us don't do that. And we have a difficult looking time looking at like a Muslim, acting like a Muslim, thinking like a Muslim, to see how we come across from the other perspective. And also, what, once you walk a mile in their shoes, you really start to understand why is it that they are coming up with these questions. Very good questions. They tend to fall in two camps, uh, the person of Christ and the authority of Scripture. What I want to do today, though, is I want to do a comparative, looking at seven areas. And I've chosen my Muslim here, Abdul, who's sitting here in front of me. Uh, you don't have to stand up. You can sit down. Oh, you can, it's all right. <laughs> I want to show the prop I'm just going to talk to you is what I'm going to do. It's going to be like a dialogue back and forth between Abdul and me. He, he didn't know about this until about two minutes ago. So he is completely fresh. He doesn't know where I'm going to go. He's just going to say yes to everything. I, when I nod my head this way, just say yes. When I go this way, just say no. All right? Be good, obedient Muslim like you. Muslims should be obedient and submissive. Yes, now, to begin with, <laughs> look at those seven areas that we do or that we have. Uh, not, let's not be careful. The seven areas where I think we have the best confidence. The seven areas where I think we can win every debate and bring the gospel into. It's very important that everything we do, we always, always, always end with Jesus Christ. Make sure he gets in there at some point. Make sure that, otherwise you're wasting your time as far as I'm concerned. If you're going to sit there and have a great tea conversation or a coffee conversation, and you've just talked about the weather, or you talk about politics or Israel or everything that's happening in the, in the news, and you haven't brought in Jesus, then what's the point? That person you'll never see again, and they may, that may be the only chance they hear the gospel. So every area you can bring the gospel into. Think and be creative about it. And we've talked about a little bit how you can do that just by looking at the news. The news is brilliant today because so much of the news has Islam in it. Unfortunately for the Muslims, it's not the, most, the news they want to talk about. But there is a good place to start out. Let's just start out with the violence of Islam that we're seeing in the press. The violence of Islam that seems to be symptomatic of what every of one of these groups, whether it's Al-Qaeda or Boko Haram or Al-Shabaab, and especially ISIS. ISIS, this violent, violent group that we're hearing in our press has nothing to do with Islam. And certainly our pundits are saying that, and many of our politicians are saying that. I would suggest that even pastors are saying that. How many in this room really believe that ISIS is not Islamic? Not one hand. Now, if I had asked this a year ago, some of you would put your hands up. And in fact, everywhere I went a year ago, usually I got one or two, maybe even half the audience would say, this is not Islamic. This is an aberration. This is like a, the David Koresha, the David Koresh's or the Jim Jones for Christians, these cults that really do not follow what Jesus is saying. The difficulty is, for Muslims, is that ISIS is going one step further. They're not just making claims, they're supporting everything they say in the text itself, going back to the Quran and supporting it from this book, modeling it by the person of Muhammad, certainly using his biography, the Sirat to Rasulullah. That's your book, right? Just say yes. And it's also his sayings, nah, the hadith. Nah, nah. 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 That's what it means yes in Arabic. Now, if you look and ask Muslims sitting on the, uh, who, who you come in contact with, then please do get to know your Muslims. The, they're all around us. They're certainly in London, we have a million of them. I'm sure every one of you, whatever cities you're in, you're going to find Muslims there. You will find that most of them would be in that middle group, that nominal group that really don't represent the radicals or the liberals. They stand to be the majority right in here. They are not sure what the radicals are saying. They're confused by the radicals. They're threatened by the radicals. They are as much in confusion as much of our politicians are. And they don't believe that anything the radicals are doing, the ISIS or the Boko Haram or the Al-Shabaab, they don't believe that this represents Islam because it's not their view of Islam. Their view of Islam uh, tends to be whatever you want it to be. It tends to reflect what we're saying. You will find a lot of Muslims will say things like, well, yes, Islam is a religion of peace, because we're told to say that. That's what we're hearing on the radio. The first question you need to ask is, can you support that? Can you go back and look at scripture? Can you bring up anything that talks about peace? I always ask my Muslim friends, can you give me one verse in the Quran that says you're to have peace with me, a Christian? Not with other Muslims, because that's easy. Peace with those who are not like you. Peace especially with the Al-Kitab, that would be Christians and Jews. See if they can answer that. Now, I've asked that for 33 years, and I have yet to find a Muslim that can come up with one. They will try to come up with Surah 109. <clears throat> to you, your religion, to me, my religion, is what it says in Surah 109. That's pretty good. That's about as close as you're going to get. But that is a Meccan Surah. 
Meccan meaning it's one of the earliest surahs that was revealed to the Prophet according to Islamic tradition. Therefore, it was revealed while the Prophet Muhammad was a minority there in Mecca. He did not have any authority. He wanted to make sure that he got along with whoever he was. He was uh, controlled by the Qurayshi there in Mecca. And it stands to reason that he would, that would be revealed to him, to you, your religion, to me, my religion. There were no Christians there. There were no Jews there. So this certainly doesn't have to do with Christians or Jews. It has more to do with animists. That's interesting. Pagans, idolatrous, those who had the 365 idols there in Mecca. Once he moved to Medina then, you can see that suddenly he came across many, according to the traditions, I'm always going to say that because I don't believe anything I'm going to say, but nonetheless, according to the traditions, once he moved to Medina, then he came across the Jews. They were the ones that controlled the commerce in Medina. They were the ones that were the rich ones, and they were the ones that are causing the problem because you have the Ansar, who were the native uh, Medinans, who did not like the Jews because the Jews controlled the commerce. And so they asked Muhammad to be an arbiter between the two groups, and he came as an arbiter in 622. The first thing he did, like any good arbiter, he made a relationship with the Jews. And the first thing he did was he got a revelation to change the Qibla back up to Jerusalem. And for two years, the Qibla was towards Jerusalem, trying to ameliorate himself, trying to uh, create a type of relationship with the Jews. It didn't work. After two years, it didn't work. And immediately then in 624, when they rejected him, he re then rejected them. And that's where the confrontation with the Jews began. So where are these verses that say you're to love or to have or to even get along with Jews. No, in fact, the Quran says quite the, diff quite the opposite. Surah 5, Ayah 51 is very clear. Have nothing to do with Jews or Christians, for they are friends of one another, and he who is a friend with them is one of them. That's in the Quran. That was written in Surah 5. That's a Medinan Surah. Surah 9, Ayah 29 is very clear. Make war on the people of the book. And that's exactly what Muhammad did, starting in 624. But remember, Surah 9 is at the very end. It's from 632. It's the last Surah that was revealed to the Prophet. So he starts to confront the Jews in 624, throws the Banu Kainukav out. In 625, throws the Banu Dadir out. In 627, takes the Banu Quraysa family, the largest Jewish family, and attacks them for 21 days. Finally, he takes all the men and uh, the children and women and makes them concubines and slaves of his, with his, for his men. And then takes every one of the men, 800 of them, gives them spades, they uh, dig trenches, and then their throats are slit. 800 men in one afternoon. That's the beginning, and really, that's the end of the Jews. After 627, there were no Jews left in Medina. None. Now we have a name for that. We call that genocide. Yet how many people would dare say that Muhammad committed genocide? Is Muhammad a man of peace then? Not in my book, he's not. Not what he did to the Jews in Medina. Now, everything I have just told you, you can find in five sources. I'm going to give them to you right now. Ibn Isham, Al-Wikidi, Al-Buhari, Sahih Muslim, and Al-Tabari. You can find that story, those stories of the Banu Qurayza, the Banu Kainuka, the Banu Nadir, in five different sources, in three different genres. The Sirah, the Hadith, and the Tafsir. So it's not me saying this. This is your own material, Abdul. You've got a problem here. So tell me again, where is this piece that you're talking about? You can't find it. Yeah, it's fact. I would suggest that maybe it was peaceful in Mecca with other Meccans. But once you move to Medina, suddenly you attack the Jews. Your prophet did. They eradicated all the Jews. There were no Jews left after 627. Is that really a model for today? Why don't you come back to Jesus Christ? Oh, I love Jesus Christ. Because he was attacked, was he not? You know that he was attacked. You know he was vilified. You know that he was whipped. You know that he had to carry that cross through the streets and people spat upon him as they put him on the cross. They speared his side and they called him all kinds of names. And how did Jesus react? You know the story. Let me help you. You're having a hard time saying it. But we know how he reacted. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Ooh, now what would you rather have today? And what do we need today? We need that model for today. And that model is the model that's been around for 2,000 years, not just 1,400 years. In fact, I would suggest that ISIS is following the model of Muhammad right to the T. We follow the model of Jesus Christ. Jesus is really the man for today, is he not? Oh, let's talk about Jesus and Muhammad. Let's do that comparative right there. <clears throat> now, Jesus for you, Issa, in fact, I heard a great talk just yesterday, in fact, this morning, by an Italian named Francesco, and he talked about a man named Issa, and he was confused because he says, when you look at Issa, it's not the right name. In the, in the Quran, what's the name for Jesus? Issa. What's it mean? 
Let me help you. Do you know? Yeah, Yeshua. What does it say? Yeshua is the name for Jesus and in Arabic. And for 2,000 years, the Arabs have used that name. Which book do you find this name? Yeshua? All the Ar Christian Arabs use Yeshua. It's like Yeshua in Hebrew. What does it mean, Yeshua? Ah, God saves. But not Allah. Yeshua. We'll get to Allah next. Hold on a minute. Because another man named Francisco told me about that. But let's just go back to Yes Issa. If it's not Arabic, yet you tell me the Quran is in perfect Arabic, right? That there are only Arabic. It's an Arab book for the Arab people in the Arab language. Then why is Issa not Arabic? Why is, is the name Issa not Arabic? Uh, you don't know. That's fine. I don't expect you to know because to you don't talk about this. So can you show me any reference to Issa prior to the 7th century? Or better yet, no. can you show me any reference to Issa prior to the Quran? Go to my... I have for 33 years, and no imam can show me any reference to Issa. It is introduced by your Quran. It's introduced by the Quran, which suggests that it comes from another source. But Issa will come back. Issa will come back. I have no idea because I don't know, I don't recognize, I still don't know who Issa is. And he will be the Khalifa, the Khalifa, forever. Issa will do that. But see, I don't even know who this person is because he's not my Jesus. He's not Yeshua, because what do we know about Yeshua? Yeshua, we know very clearly, Yeshua is a man who comes as God to earth. Now, Issa is not God to earth, right? He makes that claim very clear in Surah 4, Ayah 171. He also makes that claim very clear when he denies his divinity in Surah 5, Ayah 116, when God even says, is it true, Issa, that you and your mother are to be gods? Issa says, no, no, or as you say, no. Yeshua, he... He can come to earth. He's God. Who Thank you. To earth. But Issa cannot. Okay. So well, already we've got two different Issa, two different Jesuses. Now we understand. It's a misrepresentation. Who, who has the misrepresented who? It looks like the Quran has misrepresented who Jesus is. In fact, one of the biggest problems I have with Issa is that he lets another man die on the cross. Surah 4, 157. Another man takes on his image, or God puts his image onto another man, and that man dies on the cross. To me, that destroys everything I know about God. And it looks like Issa doesn't even exist. It looks like you've got the wrong Jesus. So where did Issa come from? <clears throat> where did it come from? Issa? Uh, and Jibril came to me. No, no, no. Where did the concept of Issa <laughs> came from? If it doesn't exist prior to the Quran, it looks like you borrowed it from a source. Let me help you. If you look at the 93 references to Issa in the Quran, you will see that almost every one of them we can trace back. We can trace every one of those references to Issa, not Yeshua, Issa, back to Gnostic writings. These are a cult that existed in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th century, uh, where they did not like the person of Jesus, and they made him, they said, how could God take on human form? They, the Gnostics did not believe that uh, flesh was good, it was evil. How could God take on evil form? And so therefore they diminished the, the belief that that was God. They completely eradicated any notion that God was in human form. And they kept on talking about things that this Issa did do. But they used the, they wrote in Syriac. And in Syriac, the name they gave to this character, who they thought was Jesus, was Iesu. That's the name in Syriac. And they kept on saying that this Iesu, as a child, he took some clay, molded it into birds and blew on them and they flew up into the air. That comes from the second century. That comes from a Gnostic account. Because this is the wrong Jesus. I don't know anywhere, I don't know where anywhere in my Bible that Jesus as a little child made birds out of clay. Do you? Does anybody here know that? Yet there it is in the Quran, taken from a Gnostic writing from the second century, incorporated into the Quran, and even not only do they have the story, They've also incorporated the name. They've taken Iesu, and when you take Iesu into Arabic, it becomes Issa. No wonder it's not Arabic. It's Syriac. You've got the wrong man doing the wrong thing in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong name. I want to ask you about Muhammad. You tell me that Muhammad's a prophet. Did Muhammad do anything that a prophet would do? What are the four criteria for prophethood? Now, to do that, you need to come back because you don't know. Because, and when you don't know, you're told in your Quran, in Surah 10, Ayah 93, in Surah 21, Ayah 7, in Surah 4, Ayah 146, in Surah 5, Ayah 46 and 47, and also Surah 5, Ayah 68. If you have any question, you're to come to whom? Who are you to come to? The people of the book. To, to me. Book. Yeah. To us. We are the people of the book. So you're told over and over and over again, if you have any question, come to us. Yes. 
And there's an awful lot of the Quran you don't understand, like you already you're on, you don't understand. You need to ask us, what is the criteria for prophethood? And there are four criteria in our scriptures. Very clear that a prophet must come in a prophetic line. And the prophetic line is only in one line. And this is what God, well, Abraham asked God in Genesis chapter 17. God was there and Abraham turns to him and he says, what about my son Ishmael? What are you going to do with my son Ishmael? God answers him in verse 20 and 21. I will bless Ishmael. He will have 12 sons. They will be the ruler of 12 nations. But my covenant is with Isaac. My covenant is with Isaac. A few chapters later in verse 22, God comes to Abraham and asks not once, not twice, but three times, give me your one and unique son, your one and only son, Isaac. God's already dismissed Ishmael. Abraham had two sons. Did God forget? No, as far as God was concerned, Ishmael was no longer the son of Abraham. God no longer had anything to do with Ishmael. He only was looking at Isaac. And that's why all the prophets come in the line of Isaac, even in your Quran. Look at Surah 29, Ayah 27, or 24, sorry. Look at Surah 29, you will see, even there is a line, Yaqub, I mean, sorry, Ibrahim, Isaac, and Yaqub. Where's, my, where's Ishmael there? How many prophets are there listed in your Quran? The most important prophets, maybe 25. How many are there listed in your Quran? 25? Maybe 25, the most okay. important. Four of them, we don't know who they are. They may be Zoroaster names. We have not yet found out their names. Two of them are Ishmael and Muhammad. They're not in the prophetic line. The other 19, the other 19 are all in the line of Isaac. Bingo, you've got a problem here, which suggests that you people needed a prophet because all the prophets that you were dependent on came in the line of Isaac. You needed an Arab prophet with a scripture prophet. Now that's why in Surah 7, Ayah 157, and Surah 61, Ayah 6, the umiyun that is there is a plural, masculine plural. It is scriptured. It is not unlettered. It is not, um, um, what's the word when you can't read or write? Illiterate. illiterate. It's not illiterate. It's unscriptured. You don't have a scripture. You need a scripture. That's why it's there in the Quran. You've got to find a scriptured prophet, which means you've got to create a prophet, which means then you've got to give him a book. That's why it says, find reference to this unscriptured prophet who is named Ahmad, which is diminutive of Muhammad, and you must find him in the previous scriptures, the Torah in the Injil. And you go to Deuteronomy 18 and try to find him there. If you look at verse 19 and 20, look at, don't just stop with verse 18, Read 19 and 20, and what does it say very clearly? It says, beware of those who come speaking, but they speak not in my name. If you read verse 17, it's Yahweh. I never heard this name. That's right. God bless you. You're going to hear it now. He's another God. Hold on a minute. We're going to talk about him. So right there it says, be careful, because in verse 7, he gives the name that he wants him to speak in. Be careful of anybody that comes with another name, that does not speak in my name. A prophet who speaks not in my name, verse 20, put him to death. We're to put Muhammad to death if he does not speak in Yahweh's name. The fact that you don't even know the name Yahweh, the fact that that name is not even in your book, the fact that your prophet never knew that name, suggests to me that you've got the wrong prophet. He doesn't even know God's holy name. We're going to get to that. Hold on to a minute. It also says that every prophet, to be a prophet, must do something to prove he's a prophet. He must either do a prophecy. What did prophecy did Muhammad do? Uh, oh, oh, hold on a minute. He did a prophecy. Uh, 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 there was something that, uh, he claimed that the Byzantines were going to be defeated by the Persians in a few years. This was supposedly written in yes. six this supposedly was written in six, the 7th century, but this took place in 630. Heraclius is the one that came back and then defeated the Persians. So actually, that's a false prophecy. Because it's not the Persians defeating the Byzantines, it's Heraclius that defeated the Persians. Bingo, we've got you there. What else must all prophets do? They must do a miracle. What did Muhammad do as a miracle? Show me one miracle, Muhammad. Now, I heard over here, split the moon. That's in Surah 56, Ayah 1. Take a look at, I'm sorry, Surah 54, Ayah 1. I want you to open up that verse and read to see if it has anything to do with Muhammad. Is Muhammad's name there? Is it about the end of times? At the end of times, the moon will split, right? So that's nothing to do with Muhammad. That's yet to happen. I believe Muhammad lived before us, right? He sure he didn't come after us. So you've got a problem. 
Now, you can see the Hadith have to make up all these stories. They have to say that he, his heart was opened up, angels. It wasn't he that did the miracle, the angels. So he doesn't, he's not in the prophetic line. He doesn't know God's holy name. He doesn't do anything to prove he's a prophet. He cannot do miracles. Three times when they ask him to do a miracle, he says, why should I do a miracle? I'm nothing more than a Rasul. Rasul means messenger. It's not Nabi, which would be a prophet. Why did he say Nabi at that time? He says, I'm a Rasul only. That's a messenger. Messengers before came and you killed them. I'm nothing more than a Rasul, proving that he did, that's not much of a defense. So that's number three. Number four, every prophet must p parallel what other prophets have gone before. So God does not give contradiction after contradiction after contradiction. Every prophet must have one revelation that follows another, that follows another, that follows another. Look at all the prophets, all the prophets that came before. Every one of their books that were given by them, they all parallel each other. They all fit to the same thing until you get to the Quran. Then the Quran confuses everything. Doesn't even know which book, which son was supposed to be sacrificed by Abraham. Is it Ishmael? Is it Isaac? Do you know? Don't go to the Quran, you're not going to find out. You think it's Ishmael, but it's very clear that it's not in the Quran. You have to put that there because you need something to give authority to Ishmael. But if you look at your exegetes, almost half your exegetes believe that it was Isaac. <coughs> Nonetheless, you've got lots of problem with Issa in the Quran. He spends his time. But this is interesting. Issa in the Quran does things that even Muhammad cannot do. Issa was born of a virgin. Now, why is that important? You have no idea. You've got to come to us again. We'll tell you why it's important. Go to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, and you'll see why that's important. Because Isaiah is very clear that a sign, this will be a sign. A virgin will conceive and bear a son, not a daughter, but a son, and will call him Emmanuel. God with us. So when a virgin conceives, now you know in our, li in our lives, no virgins conceive. They wouldn't be virgins if they conceived, by definition. When a virgin conceives, wake up, Abdul, because then something spectacular is happening. When that happens, God is with us. That's why it's important that Jesus came from a virgin. This was prophesied 100 years, 800 years earlier. In Surah 3, Ayah 436, it says that this child who was born a virgin, you call him Issa, spoke from the cradle. Now, I don't believe he did. I don't see any reference to that, except, again, in Gnostic writings. In the Nagamati Gospel, you get that reference to Issa speaking as a child from the cradle. Then you see that said in first three verses later that he raises from the dead. He, this child, he is able to heal the, the lepers, give sight to the blind, and create out of nothing. Could Muhammad do any of this? <coughs> no. Not at all. Also, it says that Muhammad had to ask forgiveness for sins. Surah 48, verse 1 and 2, to ask forgiveness for the sins you have done and the sins you are yet to do. So he sinned. But there is one in the Quran that did not sin. Surah 19, Ayah 19. His name is ooh, Issa, the man we've been talking about. Now, he's not my Jesus, but at least the Quran gets that correct. There is one individual who is sinless. That's Issa. Now, let's go back and look at these two books. These are the two books we're really big. Have you noticed we've been quoting quite a bit from this book? We've been trying to help you with yeah. this book. Yeah. You know, this book has lots of problems. We have a lot of problems with this book. This is the only revelation you have. Let me give you some inferences. Like, for instance, we just were discussing this morning some of the scientific problems in this book. I don't know if you're aware of the fact that uh, you have a whole industry of scientific proofs in the Quran. Embryology, Surah 23, verse 12 and 4. You have a reference to four stages of the embryological cycle in the Quran. And Muslims, you included, say this is a proof that this must be miracle. Because how could someone have, uh, how could someone in the seventh century have known about the zygote, have known about the alaka stage, which is the chewed mass stage, and then the bones following the flesh? Those are the four stages found in Surah 23. There's a problem. First and foremost, do you believe that that's unique to the Quran? Yes. You do. Yes. Oh, have you tried and looked and seen if that was found earlier? I rely on the information. I Let me help you then. Let me give you some new information. There's a man named Galen, who was an embryologist, a Jewish embryologist in the second century, who also talked about four stages of the embryo. The zygote, followed by the chewed mass, which is alaka in Arabic, followed by the bones, followed by the flesh. Bingo! That's in the second century. And look and see where his writings are found today. They're found in what used to be called stesiphon which is the city of Baghdad. Where did Islam have its headquarters when the Quran was being formed? Ooh, tu, 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 tu. Okay. 
looks like they took it straight from the libraries there in Baghdad. It's been around, it was around for 600, sorry, 400 years, 500 years. It was well known in that part of the world. You just incorporated Galen's writings. Now you call this a miracle, but see, Galen made a mistake. Any embryologist today knows that whether or not there was a zygote or a chewed mass, that you can find when a woman miscarriages, you can see the fleshy mass there, that's visible. The problem is the next two stages. Bones do not precede the flesh. Every good embryologist knows that they form together simultaneously. Galen made that mistake. The Quran has incorporated that mistake. Shame on whoever wrote the Quran for incorporating the mistake into it. Bingo, you've got a problem. Surah 67, verse 5, and Surah 72, ayah 8 and 9. There you have references to meteorites. In the Quran, what are meteorites for and what do they do? They chase the demons away. They're in the sky as blazing stars to chase the demons who are listening to the Quran being recited in heaven. And they chase them away. Now tell me something. How do animate objects chase away inanimate objects? And do you really believe the demons are in the skies? And, they're, and there's a, what is that? There's a whole series every year of like a whole period of meteorites that come, the, the, something shower. It happens in the spring. Anybody know the hominids or something like hominids shower? Persoid, okay, we'll go with that. It's one of these showers that comes every spring, and you're told to go out to look at it. Of course, you can't in England because everything's cloudy every night. But when it does, if you, you can see them, and they're all going in the same direction, which suggests that the demons are only up there that time every spring, whenever that shower of meteorites come along, being chased away. And that's the only time they want to listen to the Quran being read. Can you see how, how pre scientific man would understand that? Let's go to Surah 31, Ayah 10. Surah 31, Ayah 10 talks about the mountains were placed on the earth as tent pegs to keep the earth from shaking. Now, do you really believe that? No. Yes. Look at Nepal. Yes. Look what just happened in Nepal, in the greatest of all mountains, the Himalaya mountains. Shaking all over the place, enormous damage. Why is it that the mountains, you find more earthquakes than anywhere else? Allah has a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> Abdul has a sense of humor. But he seems to be contradicting what Surah 31 Ayah 10 says. In fact, it's just the opposite. He has created the heavens without any pillars that you see, and has set on the earth firm mountains, lest it should shake with you. And he has scattered there in moving creatures of all kinds. Now that's just one of five references. That's the most obvious one. But we now know today, and since modern science knows, that there are tectonic plates that are under the surface of the earth. And tectonic plates are colliding against other tectonic plates. And they create wrinkles in the earth's surface. And that's what the Himalaya mountains, our most mountain ranges, are created by those tectonic plates colliding. And that's what creates the shaking. Mountains aren't there to stop the shaking. They're, they are part of the shaking. That's where, why most of your volcanic action and certainly all of your earthquakes happen where mountain ranges are. The very opposite of what the Quran says. Let's talk about Surah 86, Ayah 5. It talks about semen. Semen. Now we know where semen is made. I don't want to explain it. I think you know where semen's made. <laughs> but according to the Quran, it says in verse uh, 5, semen is made between the kidney and the ribs. Do you really believe that? And here's another one that I like. Um, Dual Karnain. Dual Karnain is Alexander the Great in Surah 18, verse 86 to 103. And you have Dual Karnain coming down there. And he sees the, he runs to the west and he sees the, oh, the sun setting in muddy waters. So the sun sets in waters, which means the sun's moving, the earth standing still. That's a problem. Then he runs to the east and he sees the sun coming up out of the waters again and the people are getting burned by the sun because it's so close to them. So then he runs to the north and he sees these people being attacked by these barbarians from across the mountain. So dual cut a line. He sets up this wall made out of iron topped with copper from one mountain to the other. Now you can see the mountain over there and we're on this side to set up a wall right across the mountains. That's a pretty big wall if you're keeping out an entire army. Do you believe that really happened? If 
let's just put this in perspective. We do know who Alexander the Great is. We know when he lived, 3rd century BC. There are three biographies of Alexander the Great. We do know that in none of the biographies does it talk about anywhere that he goes to the east or to the west or to the north or that he sets up a wall that is between two mountains big enough to keep the entire armies of the Persians out. That's a pretty big wall. That would be one of the greatest feats of ancient history. It would be one of the greatest wonders of the world. Why is there no reference to it? in any of the biographies. Why is there no wall that we can see today? Bingo, you've got a problem. So obviously this must be borrowed as well. I'll tell you where it's borrowed from. It's actually borrowed from Heraclius. In 630, writes a political tract. And in the tract he writes about this great king, king, uh, his name is Alexander the Great, who in the 900 years earlier, which he's now writing in 630, 900 years earlier, he writes about this great King Alexander who goes to the west and watches the sunset, who goes to the east and watches the sunrise, and goes to the north, and he protects the, bar the, barbar the, the people from the barbarians across the map by building a huge wall. And he says, and someday in 900 years, there will come another king who will destroy those people from across the wall. Now, who did that in 630? Heraclius did it. And he wrote about it. And he says, I am a fulfillment of that prophecy. It's a political track written by Heraclius, the Byzantine emperor, in 630 AD, tr basically just creating a story out of nowhere from Alexander the Great and saying he is the fulfillment of that story. That entire story, with all the references, get incorporated into Surah 18. Surah 86 to 103. Bingo. It's all been borrowed. Everything. Now, earlier today, we heard a reference about that the, we must be careful about the Bible. It said in Surah 2, Ayah 79, be careful about those Jews who write with their own hands. Why? Because they know not the book. They but guess. Then they write with their own hand and call it the book. That's Surah 2, Ayah 78 and 79. And of course, you as a Muslim would say that proves that the Bible has been corrupted. What do you think it's referring to? What Jews write with their own hands? They don't know the scripture, so it's not scripture, it's not the book. It's not the El Kitab, or the Kitab. What Jews write with their own hand that's not scripture? What? Anybody know? The sectarian groups. Right? No, that's the Christian. What is the Jewish apocryphal writings? What are they? The Talmud. Mishnah in the Talmud. Isn't that interesting? It's saying, beware of the Mishnah, the people, the Jews who write the Mishnah and the Talmud. Now, let me help you here. Look at the story of Cain and Abel in Surah 5. Cain kills his brother Abel in verse 31. He doesn't know what to do with the body. So in verse 32, he, well, I'm sorry, in verse 31, he sees a raven, a bird, scratching and burying its partner. So he follows the example of the raven and buries his brother. Now, that's interesting because that's not in my Bible. I don't know that story anywhere in my Bible, but I can tell you where that comes from. That comes from the Talmud of Benethan, Ben Uzziah. The Talmud of Ben Uzziah was written in the second century by Jews as nothing more than a story about Cain and Abel. It was not part of scripture. It was written long after scripture had been canonized because the Old Testament was canonized in, 60, in 80 AD at the Council of Jamnia. But here in the second century, this story about Cain and Abel is put together. Look at the next verse that follows it, verse 32. O children of Israel, he who takes the blood of one, it's as if he takes the blood of all. But he who saves the blood of one, it's as if he saves the blood of all. You Muslims quote that to me all the time to showing that that proves that you're a religion of peace without realizing you've got to put that with verse 31. We know why. Because in the 5th century, a scribe was writing out the Talmud of Jonathan ben Uzziah. And as he was writing it out and copying it, in the margin with his own pen, he writes about the blood of Abel. He who takes the blood of one takes the blood of all, but he who saves the blood of one saves the blood of all. He was just writing off the top of his head. In the late fifth century, that editorial comment, along with the story of Cain and Abel, is then incorporated into the Bar Sanhedrin, chapter four, verse five, written in the late fifth century as nothing more than a story, an apocryphal account, with an editorial comment written by a scribe in the fifth century. The entire thing is then put into Surah five. Ayah 31 and 32. We know who wrote it. We know when it was written. We even know why it was written. It has nothing to do with God. It has everything to do with man. Now let's go to Abraham. Surah 21. Ayah 51 to 71. There you have Abraham waking up in the middle of the night and he notices that everybody's asleep. So he goes to the Kaaba. Hold on a minute. Where's the Kaaba? Mecca. Mecca. So it means Abraham's in Mecca. Abraham in Mecca? I don't recall ever Abraham being that far south. That's 
a thousand kilometers too far south. Nonetheless, the Quran says he's there in the Kaaba. He goes into the Kaaba in Surah 21, and he takes all the idols and takes a big idol and destroys them. Bam, 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 destroys all the idols. The next morning, the people wake up. They see all the broken idols. They come to Abraham and says, what have you done? He says, don't talk to me. Talk to the idol, the one that's last remaining. They take him and they throw him into a fiery pit. That's in chapter 21, verse 51 to 71. Did Abraham ever go to Mecca and destroy the idols in the Kaaba? Did Abraham get thrown into a fiery pit? Hold on a minute. We know of three men that did get thrown into a fiery pit, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So where does this come from, this story? It certainly doesn't come from the Bible. You want me to tell you where it comes from? Yes. It comes from the Mishnah of Rabbah. The Mishnah of Rabbah is another apocryphal account written in the second century AD, not BC AD. This is after the Old and New Testament had already been finalized, written as a child's story, a children's story in the diaspora, written down in the Arabic traditions. Fascinating, because the Jews would never, had never translated the Torah or the book, all the Old Testament. None of the Old Testament was translated into Arabic until the late 8th century. So therefore, the only books that the, Jews, that the Arabs had that was accessible to them were these Talmudic Mishnah accounts, these apocryphal writings. And it's those apocryphal writings that get written in Surah 5, Ayah 31 and 32, Surah 21, Ayah 51 to 71. And I could go to Surah 27, but I see I'm going to run out of time. Surah 27, Ayah 19 to 44. That's probably the most engaging story, and that's the story of Solomon and Sheba. Have you read that story? Do you all know that story of Solomon and Sheba? Do you want to know it? <laughs> Solomon, he's takes birds and he marches them, left, right, left, right, left, right, to get ready for battle. The first air force ever invented was by Solomon. And the birds would fly up into the air and they would drop stones on the enemy, according to verse 17 and 18. And they would, on the bottom of the stone would be the enemy they're going to kill. That's in your Quran. I'm just quoting your Quran now. It's a nice caricature. I like it. It's very nice. But there was one day he noticed that one bird was missing, the hoopoe bird. Hoopoo, hoopoo. That's why it's called the hoopoe bird. It makes that sound. I have, we have them in India, so I grew up with them. The hoopoe bird with a big crest. This bird's missing, and that's his favorite bird. And he gets angry that the bird's not there. He says, where's the hoopoe bird? And then suddenly he looks in the south, and it comes flying, and it lands at his feet. And it talks to him. I had no idea that Solomon could talk to birds, but evidently he could, according to the Quran. The bird talks about this beautiful land in the south where this queen is. Beautiful queen. Queen of Sheba. He said, you must go see her. He said, I'm too busy marching my birds. You go on down and bring her back up. So the bird flaps on back down to Sheba, lands at the feet of the queen of Sheba, talks to the queen. Did you know the queen could talk to the birds? According to your Quran. And so the queen comes up from Sheba. She comes up to where Solomon is there in Jerusalem. She, he's sitting on his throne in his big throne room. Now, in the middle of the throne room is a pond, water. And there's a glass over top of the pond. She comes in the door and she sees that. She has never seen glass like that. She thinks she's going to get her skirts wet. So she pulls up her skirts as she walks across, thinking they're going to get wet. And that's where the story ends in verse 44 in the Quran. What, what, what I don't know, because the story ends in verse 44. Oh. Listen, you don't find any story in the Quran that begins or ends anyways. This is oh. another one. You want to know what happens? I'll tell you yes. where you need to go to find out what happens. Because that's not in my Bible. Nowhere in my Bible does that story exist. It's in the second Talmud of Esther. The exact same story, almost word for word, that I just saw, told you in the Quran. It was written in the second century. It was a bedtime story for Jewish children. It was a story they had heard in diaspora, and they put Solomon's name to it to make it more familiar. Never considering it to be historical, nothing, certainly part of the Bible. And the end of the story is in the second Talmud of Esther. Read the end of the story. It gets very funny. As she comes across to pick up her skirts, she has hairy legs. When Solomon sees the hairs on her legs, he cries out in surprise. That's the end of the story. Now that has been taken off and not incorporated into the Quran because it's very demeaning to Queen Esther. But what have I just said? Hold on a minute. Surah 5, Ayah 31 and 32. Ben, Jonathan ben Uzziah and the Bar Sanhedrin. Surah 21, Ayah 51 to 71 is the mission of Rabbah. Surah 27, Ayah 17 to 44 is the second Talmud of Esther, Talmud, Mishnah, what are these? Remember what I said at the very beginning? Be careful of the Jews who know not the book, but they write with their own hands and call it the book. Surah 2, Ayah 78. 
What is the Quran warning the Muslims about? Be careful of these apocryphal accounts. Be careful of these accounts written by Jews. They are not part of the book. They write with their own hands. It's basically saying, be careful of the Quran. Don't trust Surah 5. Don't trust Surah 21. Don't trust Surah 27. These are written by Jews who know not the book. It's basically an own goal. I love it. That's why I love Surah 2, 2 Ayah 78 and 79. It destroys the Quran for me. Bingo, you've got problems here. Now see, we don't have this problem with the Bible. There's no warning at all about some scripture that's not there. See, in the Bible, you look at the Bible, books begin, books end. Stories begin, stories end. You can go from Genesis all the way to Gen Revelation, and everything along it, it fits to a piece. You can see God is working right there in Genesis, and he already tells us what he's going to do in chapter 3. He says, from your line, a woman's line, it's going to be a woman's line, it has to be a woman because she was the one that was first deceived. From a woman's line also is going to come salvation. It's going to come through a woman's line, and it's going to be a male, he, and that this male is going to destroy the head of Satan. That means he's going to destroy the evil that was caused. Who do you think this man is? Well, see, he doesn't tell us right there who this man is. But all the way through Bible, he gives us a tag after tag after tag. This man is going to be known as the Messiah, Al-Masihu. This man is going to be known as the Son of God. This man is going to be known as the Son of Man. In fact, that's going to be his most important title. This man is going to be... God with Isa. us. Isa Yeshua, yeah. I'm talking about Yeshua. Yeshua. This not is not Isa. Isa. Not Isa. Okay. No, this is Yeshua. Now we have to understand Yeshua. No. But you have to go to the Bible to find out about Yeshua. There's 330 prophecies about this one man that was referred to, to, uh, to Eve. Now what's interesting to me is that when Jesus comes, he claims exactly those titles. He claims to be the Son of God. He claims to be the Messiah. And he specially claims to be the son of man. Now, that's the one you like the most because that means he must be a man if he's the son of man. Yes. 25 times in the New Testament, he makes that title, claims that title for himself. To understand what that title means, you need to go back to Daniel chapter 7, verse 14. Because it defines it right there. The son of man, he will come in the clouds. He will be from everlasting to everlasting. Abdul, who is from everlasting to everlasting? No. Only God. So the Son of Man is from everlasting to everlasting, will have dominion over all tribes, nations, peoples, and tongues, who has dominion over everybody and everything. God. So the Son of Man is God, right? Bingo. Everything that the Son of Man does is a name for God. So you tell me and you ask me, where does Jesus ever claim to be God? Every time he claims to be Son of Man, that's 25 times, he is saying, I am God. Every time he claims to be Son of God, I am God. Every time he claims to be the Messiah, he's saying, I am God. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 50, 52 to, I'm sorry, 62 to 66, in those four sentence verses, you will see three times where Jesus claimed to be God. Because the, the chief priest, Caiaphas, a Jew, knew that this God would be, have two titles. And that's why he turns to Jesus in verse 62. He says, are you the son of God? Are you the Messiah? He specifically asked that, the anointed of God. And what did Jesus say? Yes. And then he goes and did, adds a third title. And you shall see the Son of Man claiming to be the Son of Man. So he claims to be Son of God, Messiah, and Son of Man already within one scenario. There in front of the Caiaphas, in front of the Sanhedrin. Look and see what Caiaphas does. He tears his coat, turns towards the Sanhedrin, and said, What further proof do we need? This man has blasphemed. Now you understand why Yahweh is so important. Because even Jesus carries that name in his name. And it's Yahweh that we're looking for. And it's Yahweh that Moses needed to know. And it's Yahweh that all the prophets used. It is Yahweh, from the very beginning, has always been the unique name of God. The holy name of God. The eternal name of God. So holy that the Jews won't pronounce it today. They always put Adonai whenever they read it there. Yet this is the name that every prophet knew. And this is the name that Jesus used in John 8, 58. John 8, 58, he says, when they said, how do you know Abraham? And he says, well, before Abraham was Yahweh, Ego Amy, I am. Claimed that name. And the Jews picked up stones to stone him, realizing that here a mere man not only was using the name, he was claiming it for himself. Now, that's fascinating that your prophet never knew that name. But can you see, we're not talking about the same God. It's obviously 
that we're not talking about the same God because your God is Allah, our God is Yeshua. Allah just means the God. It's generic. It's actually a pagan God. I don't know if you know this, but if you look back and look, do some historical studies on the word Allah, you will find that it actually is a Nabataean God. The Nabataeans, their God was Allah, the God. Generic. But that wasn't his only name. He also was known as Hubal. Just like we have Elohim and Yahweh, the Nabataeans have Allah and Hubal. And Hubal actually is the more formal name for God amongst the Nabataeans. Allah is just the, the God. Go back to Allah. Because if you look at the Nabataean script, you will find that Allah has a wife named Alat, which is the feminine form of Allah, the masculine. Has a wife and has two daughters, Al-Manat and Al-Uzza. Now, you know your Quran very well. In Surah 53, Ayah 19 and 20. In Surah 53, Ayah 19 and 20, there are three goddesses listed there. Alat, Al-Manat, and Al-Uzza. But it doesn't, say you what, it doesn't tell you what they're doing there. They're just there. Where do you think those three names come from? Uh, from the Pantheon, you would say. Looks like. You would say from the Pantheon, I don't know. Okay, so it looks like these are goddesses. It looks like that there is, they are borrowed as well. What's interesting is, what do we know about that verse? What is, what is it called traditionally? The Surah 53. Satanic verses. Satanic verses. These are the Satanic verses that Salman Rushdie made very famous when he wrote the book, The Satanic Verses. And it's been well known for almost 1,400, well, 1,200 years about the Satanic verses, that Muhammad was seduced in Mecca to put and include these three goddesses. Well, now we know why these three goddesses are there. They are Nabataean goddesses. Allah, therefore, has a wife and two daughters. Yet Surah 4, Ayah 171 tells me that God has no son. Surah 6, Ayah 102 tells me that God has no wife. If God has no wife, what's he doing with Allah? So why is it that whoever wrote the Quran used the word Allah? Because Allah does have a wife and has two daughters. He may not have a son, but he has two daughters. Meaning that the Allah that you have in the Quran is a polytheistic God. No longer is he one God. You've got the wrong name. You've got the wrong God in the wrong place, doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. Why don't you come on back to the real God? This God is the right God in the right place, doing the right thing at the one time. He doesn't have any daughters, but he does have a son, an eternal son, has always been his son. And what's his name? Jesus. Boy, everybody's asleep. Yeshua. He's finally got it. Folks, can you see how you just do a comparative back and forth? Allah with Yahweh. Issa with Yeshua. We haven't even got about Muhammad yet uh, versus Jesus. Peace with violence. We haven't had time to even get into the kingdom of God versus the Khilafah or women in both scriptures. In every case, you can just bring him back home, bring the gospel, feed it into it. Make sure that everything we say is couched, comes back and shows that it's the God of the Bible that's the only one that I can understand. It's the God of the Bible that has a unique name that Moses refused to go down to Egypt until he heard that name in Exodus chapter 3 verse 14 and 15. needed to know that name before he went down so that the people would know which God he represented. And yet Muhammad never asked that question. Why didn't he go to the Jews in Medina and say, let me tell you who I am. I am the prophet because I share, I know your prophets, your God's name. Why isn't he didn't know that name? If he doesn't know that name, what are we to do? Deuteronomy 18, verse 20 says very clearly, we are to put him to death. We are to have nothing to do with Muhammad. We are to have nothing to do with anybody that not only is not in the prophetic line, knows, doesn't even know God's name, doesn't do anything to prove he's a prophet, and contradicts everything that all the prophets before said. Proving, strike four, you're out. Can you see then, Abdul, your name? Slave of Allah. You're a slave of Allah. You can't even question. Even your name defines who you are. Even your name defines what you do. Before God, you're nothing more than a slave of God. Now, let me ask you all here. Are you slaves of God? What are you? Children of God. And what does that mean vis-a-vis -vis your God? Do you have rights that he doesn't have? See, a slave of God, can it argue with God? I'm just crying now. No, no, but that's all right. That's all right. Even your name defines what you do. You do nothing more than obey and submit. A slave obeys and submits. All slaves do. They don't have a relationship with God other than one way to obey and submit. We as children of God, we can argue with God, can't we? Abraham argued with God. So how do you become a children of God? Are you ready? I want to know. I want to know more about Yeshua. The one thing that's missing in the Quran. The one thing that's missing in the Quran. Surah 4, Ayah 157. 
in order to know what, who God is, you need to go back to what he said to Eve. When he said to Eve, I'm going to send someone, he's going to come and destroy what Satan has done. And in order to destroy that, he has to destroy what sin has done. In order to do that, blood must be given, life must be shed. We see that in Leviticus chapter 17. So there has to be blood given, there has to be life given, there has to be a death. Expiation. An expiation, that's a good word, as an Italian, good for you. So that means it has to be, but it can't just be anybody. It must come from the line of Eve, and it must be a male, and it must come from a virgin, and it must be God with us. It is he who is sinned against is the only one that can do it. We know that there's only one man in history that fulfills every one of those criteria. There's only one man in history that did come as God to earth, that did come from a virgin, that did come as God with us, that has no sin. Even your Quran agrees with that. And his name is not Issa, his name is Yeshua. And historically, and in Arabic, his name is Yeshua, who has God's name in it. And it's that God on earth who then died on the cross. There's where the blood was shed. There's where the life was given. That happened on Friday. That's the day you re that you celebrate. Friday's here, but Sundays are coming. Three days later, he then rose from the dead, destroyed death, destroyed what Satan had done. And by doing that, fulfilled everything he promised he would do. But it had to be a man. It had to be God who is a man. It had to take on the same punishment that we were to take on. He had to do it for us. But he, had, he could be the only one He could be the only one who was sinless. In order to understand that, I'm going to ask you as a Muslim, you believe that the sacrifice must be done. And you have sacrifices. You do it on Eid. You sacrifice a goat. But where did that whole system and where did it all begin? When God comes to Abraham, what does he do? He says to Abraham, I want you to get three goats, uh, three animals and three birds. And that's, the whole, that's where the whole sacrificial system begins. He puts it on a rock, separates them, and they're to walk. Both parties are to walk through, right? Yes. Do both parties walk through? No. God puts Abraham to sleep. Only God walks through. The whole covenantal system is predicated on the notion that only God could fulfill this covenant. Man could not. Man was fast asleep. And yet you're still celebrating that without even understanding why is it you're still sacrificing goats. Because you're supposed to get a perfect goat, an unblemished goat, are you not? You mean a Yeshua? Well, Yeshua is, the final, is that final sacrifice. That is God who walked through as a burning fire. That is a prefigurement of the final sacrifice. Now it's clear, which means it is what God had said from the very beginning was fulfilled in one man. 300 prophecies pointing to that one man. All fulfilled in one man who was God on the cross, died on Friday, rose on Sunday, destroyed death, so that we could be walking and talking with him again on the other side of, of eternity. Now stop and think. Everything that I've said today, can you see the Quran completely destroys everything I've said. The Quran confuses everything that, what, who Jesus was, what he came to do, why he came to earth. The most important thing that he came to do was to die and rise. You pray seven times a day, it's only one way you're showing obedience, your submission. We actually talk with God like I'm talking to you right now. There's the relationship that's always been there and has always been right through history. God has come many times right through history. He has come and he is there, wrestled with Jacob. He was there eating with Abraham in front of the tent of Mamre. He was all the way through with the children of Israel. For 40 days and 40 nights says that he was there as a cloud during the day and a pillar of fire during the night. So he can take on any form he wants. we got a pretty big God. He takes on any form. And yet you say he cannot come as a man. He cannot come as anything else. He must say totally other, totally distant, which supports the notion that you don't even know who your God is. We know who our God is because he's come to earth many times. His name is Yahweh. And that's why I love you to come back to that God. What a God we've got. Not only that. What a God who came to earth and died and rose again. His name is Jesus. Yeshua. Yeshua. Throw away Issa. Come on back to Yeshua. <laughs> Throw away Allah. Come back to Yahweh. Can you see? Yahweh Akbar. He's the God we're looking for.